So today we're going to be talking about breaking free uh, as agencies shift from captive to independent. Um, this is something that we've seen in the market quite a bit. And just to get started, before I introduce our amazing, wonderful guests here, just one quick stat. So I'm sure everybody who knows, uh, you know, much about insurance would know what happened with Nationwide a couple of years back. Basically, they chose for their agents to go independent um, from captive. And this is kind of a decision they made from a top down. So um, not the only reason this webinar is going on today, but Nationwide said that 99% of those formerly captive agents went independent after they basically said, hey, you have to do this or switch industries. And I think we're seeing that a lot. When, when captives leave, they don't typically go to another agency. The majority of the time, they're going independent. But I don't think I could find one on the internet. I don't think there's an exact playbook that somebody has out there. And you know, maybe Jimmy or Camille, that's an idea for you. I'll take 10% of whatever you get from your book revenue from it. But um, I, don't, I don't think there's an exact playbook of what you should do and what you can do as you shift from captive to independent. So the goal of today is to go through that, give some insight from a couple people who have done it. So introducing Camille Hicks to start. And Camille, nobody wants to hear me talk the whole time. So I'll let you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about it. Uh, and then um, we'll introduce Jimmy after that. Awesome, awesome. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here and my name is Camille Hicks. I, I was captive um, for a couple of years and went independent. Um, so I've been independent now for over 10 years. In total, I've probably been in the industry for 12 years. Um, so I do focus on commercial and life insurance, kind of a random combination. Um, and I love to share my story on how I got there, but I do offer all lines of coverage. Um, but I do tend to focus on those two areas um, in life insurance, retirement, slash retirement, and then commercial insurance as well. But I also do auto um, and home. I'm muted. Somebody had to do it. Great, Camille. Thanks for uh, the okay. introduction. Uh, always good to have you and, and be with you here on the call. So Jimmy's Thank up you. next. Um, and Jimmy, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Jimmy LaRue. I'm on the newer end of uh, independent life. Um, so I was captive for about seven years, and then uh, I just switched to the independent side about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, yeah, really enjoying it. Um, I don't know, there's tons of things that I loved about captive life as well. And so um, I feel like some people are leaving scorched earth behind them or, you know, they just uh, really hated their captive experience. I actually really enjoyed mine. It was really hard for me to switch. Um, and uh, yeah, so we just, uh, we do all lines. Um, I, in fact, we have a pretty even 50-50 on commercial and personal in, in terms of premium, um, I guess. And uh, yeah, we do life and annuities. And so uh, anyway, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jimmy, for being here. I'm um, excited to learn from you today. So a bit of, of an agenda that we've got today. So basically, we've put together a few questions that I feel like would, would at least start the conversation around what it's like going captive to independent. Um, from there, we will open it up for Q&A. Um, you can chat. Uh, you can use the Q&A function. I have enabled those. So if you want to start piling them up, uh, we can even answer them in the fly. But we'll just go ahead and dig in here. We've got about 23 minutes left. I want to make sure we're getting the most um, out of this. So the the easy lowest hanging question is, is why, right? Why did you do what you did? So, you know, Jimmy, Camille, uh, Camille, we can start with you. What drove okay. the decision to go from captive to independent? So I would say the most obvious answer for a lot of people is freedom, right? But it's a little deeper than that for me. Um, you know, I feel like one of the hardest things in insurance is to get customers, <laughs> to actually get clients in the door. And so I was actually doing a really good job at getting clients. Um, but then I would send them through my captive agency and I would lose a lot of them. I would either either to price or um, a product line that I could not provide, especially with commercial. 
And so I felt like I was making really good connections and relationships and bringing people in, but I, I lacked in the freedom to be able to offer them what they actually needed. And so that, that's what really drove my decision was just because I was doing all this hard work to get people in, but then I couldn't really help everybody. So for me, I really wanted to be able to service the people that I, I, I was attracting in and, and not having to turn them away and tell them that the price is too high or I can't provide that product line. So the freedom for me was what drove the decision. Great stuff, Camille. Jimmy, what would you say? Yeah, I think uh, also along similar lines there, <clears throat> like, I mean, there can be any number of reasons that anybody wants to go independent. Um, you know, money is obviously a big one, whether that's in the form of uh, like potentially slightly higher commission, um, higher closing ratio um, or combination. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know, for me, like, obviously, like money was a big one. Um, producing uh i don't know for me like i wasn't like a, a crazy huge producer i'm still not i'm probably a very mediocre salesperson uh, but uh i don't know like the i think the biggest thing that it boiled down to me is just um being able to operate on values that i have and just one thing that clicked and like ultimately like i've been you know going back and forth about switching for a couple of years and um, the thing that just clicked in my head was just like, ah, oh, like the thing that I value most is transparency. Like I'm, you can ask my wife, any of my friends, anybody, like I'm a horrible liar. Um, and, uh, and so I can't sugarcoat something that I don't believe in, you know? And so you can only sugarcoat a rate increase or, you know, uh, or trying to, you know, propose against a different policy so much. And if like, I'm looking at it, I'm like, ah, that's, I wouldn't take this policy, you know? <laughs> Um, and, uh, and that's on the client side also, like for me on the underwriting side, like trying to skirt things around underwriting or, you know, operate in the gray area or leave something off an application, even though I didn't say that it was blatantly wrong or something, you know, um, just like all those things, like I hate operating like that. And, uh, that's been like one of the best things for me. Um, I don't know, one of my buddies, uh, his name's Carson. He, uh, he runs a Facebook group. I guess I'll give him a shout out, but. Uh, it's called winning at insurance. So you can look that up on Facebook. It's a good group of people. But one thing that he always says is, you know, the grass isn't greener on the, you know, on the other side of the fence, the grass is greener where you water it. Um, so I think you can, you can do well in, um, um, at, at the captive side. Um, but like for me, um, I just, I felt like I could operate a little bit more transparently um, on the independent side. So Great stuff. I think we hit everywhere on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs there. I heard uh, <laughs> freedom, transparency, better customer service, more money, more opportunity, uh, and just, you know, in general, providing a, a better solution to the market. So uh, really great answers there. I think that's the first question you always have to ask yourself. Uh, before you do anything, if you've read the book, Start With Why by Simon Sinek, uh, that's what he encourages you to do with just about everything that you do in life. So great answers. Thanks for that, y'all. So what are the methods now that, that we, we've talked about the why? Obviously, you'll go through some stages where you're evaluating, right? You're saying, hey, I, I might do this. Um, oh, I'm I'm more in like the decision making phase where I'm like, I actually might do this. And then you're in the phase where you're like, all right, I'm I'm actually doing this. So what are the methods that you use, whether it's, you know, networks that you worked with, it's consulting other folks, it's strategies, it's it's software, it's tools. We'd love to hear the what since we've talked about the why. Uh, and Jimmy, you can go ahead and kick us off here. Um, just to clarify on this, uh, this is the methods and tools I used to like decide on whether or not I was going independent or once I, yeah, once I, to decide. Okay. Both. So, so pre decision. And then after you'd made the decision, you know, walk me through that process. Okay. Um, so like for me, um, I'm very analytical also probably goes back to my mediocrity in sales. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's like, can't understate how analytical, but, um, uh, so I think, um, 
for me, how I was trying to decide, like basically I looked at aggregator cluster route, um, just going scratch, and then also trying to team up with a local independent agency, have some kind of just like, I don't know, I'm from a small town, so just some kind of agreement with them that I operate for three to five years and then and then we, you know, part ways kind of a deal. Um, and so looking at all those, I for me, I really like the cluster route. It just seemed like oh, I'm getting some good back end support, which not all uh, aggregators clusters, I feel like, do provide that. I, I feel like mine I, I got really lucky with. Um, but if that back end support is there, it is kind of nice because, you know, whatever split you're taking or fee you're paying, um, it's a, a cheap way to be able to get that back end support. So um, anyway, but yeah, so I kind of looked at all three of those. And then once I was going through and interviewing those aggregators and clusters, like I went and searched out a bunch of them, narrowed it down to what I thought was kind of the top 10. And I had interviews with all 10 of them. And I asked, I had a list of, I have a little spreadsheet list of like 30 or 40 questions that I would go through. And then I would line up each of the aggregators like this. So that way I could compare their answers on each line. Um, after I had done all that, I just kind of highlighted the top ones in each question and then just decided, okay, here's my top two or three. And ultimately all three of those had their own good parts uh, to it. Um, and so I just used those good parts to negotiate between the three until I got the best deal I felt like that I could get for me. Um, so again, super analytical way to go about it, but, um, it, I don't know, worked for me. So. The old pros and cons list to a, to a higher extent there. Can't go wrong there, Jimmy. Love it. So for you, it was a lot around, you know, making sure you had the right support before you went into it. Um, and then from there, you know, once you had made the decision, what, what got you going, um, did you start with carrier partnerships? Did you start building your tech stack? What were the first couple of things you did once you said, all right, I found the network and I want to do this? Yeah. So like for me, the biggest thing, and Camille kind of touched on this was as far as finding people to, you know, quote and sell to, um, that's like, obviously number one, you got to get that flowing through. And so I just yep. kind of built like a rudimentary system just to try and get me going so that way i just could hit the ground running you know within the first week starting to quote people um and that was one thing that was nice about using an aggregator is i could use their master codes um to be able to just start quoting right away even though you know i, I wasn't familiar with those carriers at all but but yeah like uh in in terms of lessons learned like i didn't find insured mine until one year in um and i did a well i'm not sure if should I name other programs on here? <laughs> That's okay. You can do that. Okay. Um, so I was very much thinking like, oh, I just, I want to build this out to the bee's knees. Like I want the best of everything. Um, I had saved up money before I started. So I was like, I'm going Salesforce, you know? And I was like, I can build out Salesforce. I'm a relatively smart guy. And dude, it was rough. Like I didn't even, in one year, I did not even get it to the point where I could put clients in there. Um, and I mean, it sucked. Like I ended up losing, uh, I spent about 10 grand on a program that I couldn't even use once, um, in that first year. So, um, going to insured mine was super helpful having everything pre-built. Um, that basically, I don't know, just anything you can do to like get you in front of clients faster, um, and have the back end uh, is what has worked well for me. So as soon as I hit insured mine, I hit a like a fifty thousand dollar premium month, which I mean that's one and a half to two times more than I would do in a year at my captive agency. So I just uh, you know having those systems in places so to plug insured mine, but there's plenty of other systems like phones and just I mean all that kind of stuff to uh, AMS and all that to have in the background too. So. So, Jimmy, please confirm I did not pay you to say all that. <laughs> did not. <laughs> um, no, that that's great. Um, that that journey through the front end, I think if you can cut the line to to get to value as quickly as possible with your systems um, is incredibly important as opposed to, you know, building the house before you go live in it. Um, Camille, would, would love to hear the same thoughts from you, um, you know, how you came to the decision and then what happened after that as you went from captive to independent. 
Sure. Um, the switch for me was much different than Jimmy's because I think, you know, I was in the, I wasn't in the insurance industry for very long before I made the switch. And so um, aggregators, clusters, IMOs, MGAs, I had no clue. So I had no method. I just knew that um, I'm very client centered and focused on what my clients need because again for me that was the hardest part is getting them in the door so I listened to everybody over the years I was with the captive agency and tried to understand where was where was I lacking in the in the captive world what couldn't I write and then what do my clients need and so I really just went I literally started going to carriers based on what my clients needed. And that led me to utilizing my relationships. I am a strong networker. And so I really just used my network. I started making calls. I did not know to go to a cluster or to go find an aggregator. Um, I, I ran into IMOs and MGAs and aggregators through relationships with people. So I literally picked up the phone and called Progressive. <laughs> Like I didn't know, I didn't know how to get to contracts, which for anybody who's trying to make the switch, to me, the biggest thing is having product to offer and deciding what product to offer. And so um, my method was really just utilizing my relationships and that built me like now, 12 years in, I've built up a really strong network so I can get, you know, any carrier that I need and any contract that I need, I know how to get it now. But that was the, the switch was was challenging for me and there was no method. I, I didn't know to compare and to go look at different places. I literally just started going after product that my clients needed. And I would not suggest that. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest it. Um, Again, no play, a no playbook for this, so no shame. No much better way to do it. <laughs> the whole point of it. But it's, it's interesting. I think both you and Jimmy had a method of the madness. His method was, you know, I'm going to go to the networks and see, you know, the best way that I can enter the market. Yours was, I know I need to be able to provide better solutions and products. Now, what's the best way to go about that? Um, so, you know, taking some sort of input and saying, hey, this is the output I'd like to create. Yeah. And I, so I don't suggest my method to anybody because it's not, it's not easy to do. And you can't just go and get a contract sometimes. Like there are, um, there are qualifications and numbers that need to be met. You really need to understand what you need and what you're going for and find a, a network or a relationship that you can build off of because um, it was really challenging. It took me years to build um, a solid portfolio of products doing it that way. Well, uh, again, this uh, webinar is an opportunity to learn and, and cut the line in a number of ways. So I think what we're learning is you know, find the right network for one uh, that would help a lot instead of going direct to every carrier, uh, then find the right tools after that uh, and get to value as quickly as possible or, or a way that you can, you know, automate or, 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 you know, keep track of everything that you're trying to work on at the same time. Um, I'm sure we could spend another 30 minutes here alone, but we'll keep things rolling. Mm -hmm. So uh, we actually did talk about the first steps uh, on this. So that's great. Um, Camille, was there anything that you would add on your side? I know Jim may talked about this a little bit. Um, um, I, yeah, I would like to add that it's important to understand what you want to focus on. Um, you can decide to be all lines. I did because I was a captive agent and I felt like I didn't want to go from selling auto home flood and commercial and life to only selling life. You'll see a lot of independent, independent agents only sell one thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. You just have to decide what you want your agency to be. And so I think once you make that decision, then you can you can better determine where to go for your contracts because the contracts for PNC world is very different from the contracts for life annuities and health insurance. So um, I was really all over the place trying to make that first step because I was trying to sell everything. So it's important to either find a cluster aggregator that does everything or to figure out what you want to um, what you want to start with at least or focus on because that will determine where you the first steps and where you get your contracts from. So niching your niche to start with and saying, hey, I'm I'm going to really specialize here to get started and then maybe expanding from there. Yeah, I think it helps it helps you determine where to who to work with and where to get your contracts from. Yeah, yeah. and I think that answers. Um, 
one of the, the later questions that we have, but when did you do this? Was it around a market shift? Uh, was it, you know, a certain time of year? Was it when, you know, a, a, you hit the two year mark? Um, anything that impacted that as far as when you made the switch? Yeah, for, for me, um, a huge impact was homeowner's insurance. Um, my captive agency was very challenging. They had numbers that I had to meet for home, auto, and life insurance, but um, the homeowners, we had the same numbers to meet, but in my area, I'm in, I'm in Texas, um, specifically um, near Houston, but I cover the whole state. And in Texas, the, the counties where I live and where I networked, my captive agency would not even write in that in those those counties. Mm. So that became very challenging for people to call you and you're selling insurance and you you have to keep telling them we don't write in those areas. So that was a big decision for me, the market influence that helped me make the shift. And that was around 2013. Yeah. When hard, I made hard to hit your numbers when you can't sell people who are coming in the door to you, right? <laughs> yeah. So they let us they let us get other carriers but it didn't count towards our numbers. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, yeah. what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, there's probably like two or three things that factored into to mine. There wasn't a specific market type thing that happened. I, I mean, it was after COVID, um, but like, like I said, I, I uh, almost at two years, it was in the summer of 2021. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I had been thinking about leaving for a number of years. Like I said, I, it was really hard for me to leave my captive agency. And if it wasn't for my upline, I know some people don't have, you know, great experience with their upline. They get, feel like they get abandoned or whatever. Dude, my upline was like the freaking best man. Like one of them, I, I'm still like, he's one of my best friends and he brought me into insurance and just like salsa here is good dude. Um, there's about 30 or 40 agencies or agents in our agency. Um, like we did stuff once or twice a year together, had a super solid, like to my general manager's credit, I mean, just build a phenomenal culture in our agency. And it was incredibly hard to lead. Um, because you kind of feel like a, you know, feel like you're alone. Uh, that is like one downside for me is I I did feel like I kind of was alone after I left. Um and so, I mean, that is a, a real con for some people. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like influences and stuff like that, through those couple of years, like three or four years of thinking like, oh, maybe I should leave, like, ah, oh, but I don't want to, um, whatever you want to call it, like hand of God, intuition, whatever. Um, it, uh, I just, you know, had a feeling of like, oh, like I need a, I need a switch. And um uh, and so, I mean, I just pulled the trigger over the course of like a month or two and just walked away and, and then, you know, went through those interview processes. But, but I think like some of the things that were kind of influencing me from the carrier side standpoint, uh, kind of like Camilla mentioned is like not feeling like you have control over certain aspects of your business. And like, for me, one of the biggest things, like I said, my, one of my biggest values is transparency. I just, I didn't feel like it was, I was getting transparency from the carriers, like the carrot always moves, you know, like, oh, the numbers you hit last year, you would have lost your contract this year, you know, uh, because the carrot moved. And like one guy in our agency, I mean, he wrote 120 grand in, in life premium, which I mean, that's a good, good year for a single agent. And, um, but the next year he would have lost his contract because he didn't write enough apps to, to qualify uh, to keep his contract. And it, it's just mind boggling to me because they're just always tweaking trying to, and, and that makes sense, you know, but like I said, for some guys, like if their niche is, is what that carrier offers, then they become experts in that field, in their geographical area, they get referrals because they are good at what they do. And a lot of the guys in my agency, like they were like that, like killed it at life insurance, killed it at, um, farm and ag was a huge one. And so, um, but yeah, for me, I just, those weren't my specialty areas. So. Yep. Yep. So both of you, you know, feeling like the cards were stacked against you in one way or the other, uh, feeling like, hey, I got to go into a new year and try and hit these goals that were either unattainable last year or are unattainable this year based on the increase, um, all play a role in it. And I, 
I think today, you know, with with how the market is moving and, and the rate increases that are so, so steep, um, I think you both brought that up earlier. It's it's hard to go to somebody and, and take these bigger numbers and not be able to give them more options around that. Agreed. So, Camille, I know you touched on this a little bit. If you if you could have done it again, what would you do differently? You mentioned, mentioned kind of niching your niche, but anything else that y'all would add to this? Yeah, I would I would find a mentor or a consultant and I would pay for knowledge at this point. <laughs> Give me the game plan. And that's why I do I do offer that. Um, I don't advertise it necessarily, but I do offer agents for the right agents who are really serious about switching. I do kind of help them through and guide them on the process because you know, I was ready to go. I, I was good on the captive side. I hit my numbers. I was doing well. But um, when I made that switch, there was no, there was no system. There was no management system. There was no marketing system. There was nothing. So um, if I could do it again, I probably would seek out a mentor who's doing what I want to do. And I wouldn't mind paying for knowledge for the years of experience for somebody to coach me or consult me to really get the foundation set for my independent agency. Yep. Yep. Great thoughts. Um, Jimmy. Sorry. <laughs> Having trouble finding the mute button. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. And things that I would have done differently. Like I, I feel like I did a good amount of prep work, like, I saved money to to be able to you know take the hit once I left. Um, interviewed all those uh, aggregators. Um, honestly, I used there's a program called Miro M I R O, um, and it's a phenomenal brainstorming tool. Um, I use the crap out of that thing. Um, I laid out you know what kind of customers I wanted after um, the systems I wanted. Um, processes, standard operating procedures, like how I wanted my ideal agency to operate. And um, that helped me understand what I wanted out of an aggregator relationship as well. Um, so I'd say to do that. The one thing that I um, wish I wouldn't have done is I got a little too bogged down with systems, um, which is, again, my analytical pitfall always. Um, and uh, I... Uh, I would say your numero uno priority needs to be who, who do I need to talk to next and how do I get in front of more people? Like um, you need money coming in the door and it's, it's great on the independent side. Some captive carriers, the pay structures are, you know, are as earned and um, it might be lower comps. Um, so you can quickly get the funding that you need to fund your agency growth and, and like pay for a CSR to do your red work. Um, you know, just things like that. Uh, but yeah, like getting carried away with that Salesforce thing, man, that was like my biggest pitfall. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy, I was going to say, it sounds like you had it all figured out from day one, but that, that tech <laughs> and analysis paralysis yeah. before you, like, you can't, you can't manage it if you can't measure it. If there's not enough sample size to measure, you know, you can have the best system in the world with nobody going through it. So. Yeah, <laughs> dude, like literally not a single client, man. <laughs> there was my test client, Harry, and he yeah. never made it out of the pipeline. He wasn't oh, even real. <laughs> poor Harry. Um, well, anyway, I, I think we're about at time, um, a little bit over. Uh, you guys can feel free to stick around. Um, so question here, what questions should you be asking a network or aggregator if you plan to go independent? I know that's something that we touched on earlier that I think both Camille and Jimmy would agree with. Something you need to do is find the right network. Uh, what questions should we be asking them? Yeah, so I'm going to let Jimmy answer that because he has he he really had um, a foundation to start with. But I will say this first, that I became the network. I am the upline because the way I did it, I don't have uplines. Um, I am directly connected to most carriers. I do use MGAs. I do use aggregators. But um, I am, for most products and most companies, I am the upline. So it allows me to have the highest commission, but I, I put in a lot of work to be the upline. That's not like, to me, that's not the goal. But so I don't have a lot of questions that I had to ask because I, I became the network. So I will say that contracting became challenging because I was 
the upline. So there were things that I didn't know to ask, such as um, are your commissions as earned or are they advanced? Because when you're thinking you're about to get $10,000 and you get a hundred, that's a big difference. Um, you know, or 200 or whatever. Um, so you want to know your commission structure. I like to see it on paper. Um, and I like to know the commission for all the different types of products because a lot of companies, depending on what network you join, they only offer certain products with a certain carrier and they have different commissions for each. So I would ask more detailed questions about um, the commission structure um, and how they how the commissions are paid and then the only other question that I was really that I made a big mistake on that I didn't know to ask was um can I get out of this is this is this a it's almost like I don't want to say captive because they're not captive but I had I had a couple companies try to hold me hostage um and I'm independent so it's I signed a contract that basically said I was only working with them even though I was independent so I didn't know to ask um, so they told me I had to cancel contracts with other companies that I had, but I'm like, hey, I'm independent. And I didn't know to to find out if I was able to write with other companies, if I was truly independent or if I was signing on to work under their network. Yep. So I heard two big things there. It sounds like you stumbled into being your own kind of network because you put so much of that legwork in up front. Um, and then the second point, just making sure you know what you're signing, what happens when I try and leave, what happens when I try and sell a competitor, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Devil's in the details, right? Oh, and do I own my book of business? Ah, there you go. Yeah. There's a lot of companies where you can sell for them. You make commission, which is OK. You just need to understand whether it depends on what you want for your agency. I'm trying to build something that I can sell. Yep. You can't sell your commissions, but you can sell a book of business. Yep. yep. Great point. Jimmy, thoughts? Oh, yeah, I got tons of thoughts. I was actually, I think I can actually um, copy and paste this list into the chat. So I don't, I won't read all of them, but um, kind of similar things that Camille's touching on. Um, and I, like, if you're going to go the aggregator route, um, you just have to realize like they have to make money somehow. Like that's their purpose. Like they're in it to make money just like you are. And so you have to be okay with that, but also understand where they're making money off of you. And then, I mean, everything's up for negotiation until you sign. And so the, I correct me if I'm wrong, Camille, if I'm, I'm probably missing some things, but the three, th three big areas, you know, are going to be direct commissions on your new business and renewal. Um, you're going to have profit sharing. And then I just totally spaced the third one. So don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's the we'll big one. I mean, the, um, the direct there's there's companies that pay you direct commission from even when you're working through the aggregator or network, and there's some companies who pay you from the network, and it can make a difference. You need to understand it. I prefer to be paid directly from a carrier because I know that I own my book of business, and if I choose to leave, I can always transfer, roll it over, or sell it. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, like um, tons of, yeah. Uh, basically not being afraid to like get in the nitty gritty and ask them like, how much money are you making? Where are you making it? Like, um, what are the different profit sharing options? Are there any? Um, and, you know, what are my commission splits? Are there caps on my commission splits? Some oh, That's I a huge one. Them. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and then like, once you know what the commission splits are and if there's a cap or not and what the profit sharing is and uh, potential buyouts as well as buy-ins, um, you can you know extrapolate that out in a spreadsheet and say, okay, at this much premium, this is how much it's cost me. This is how much it's cost me at 250, 500, 1 million, 2 million, whatever. And just see, okay, is it worth it to me to lose out on this much money going through this aggregator? And like, for me, it totally was like, it totally makes sense. Um, but, uh, but for you, it might not be, you know, so, uh, but yeah, like getting into so the nitty gritty, even like how many agencies do you have? What's your average closing ratio per agent? What's your average account size, premium size per policy? What's your largest carriers? What's your new business rates with your, these top five carriers? And what's your renewal rates? Um, you know, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. 
the buy-in and buy-out, that's a huge thing, but also is there a non-compete or non-solicit um, after you buy out? Because um, sometimes they do that, you know, or if there's not a buyout, oh yeah, there's not a buyout, but you can't be with these carriers for four years, you know? And so it's like, oh, well, who am I going to write with? <laughs> um, so anyway. You can so see you Jimmy's analytical mind churning in real time here. Um, <laughs> Chris Torres, did I think you raised your hand. Did you have a question? Um, I can allow you to talk here if you'd like. Mr. Torres? Maybe he raised his hand on per on accident. I yeah, sorry. I raised my hand on accident. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, while we got you, do you have any questions for Camille or or Jimmy? No, I mean, I think I think this has been a good session. I think, you know, uh, they bring up some really great points. Um, so, you know, obviously we have a a, a, a group or an aggregator. Um, there's, <clears throat> as both both participants said, there's a, a big difference between uh, all groups out there and knowing what you're what you're getting into is is key. Uh, because you're you're essentially entering a long-term relationship, and so you want to know that uh, the group you're joining is a group that uh, is going to help you and not not take advantage of you. And so the key is to to make sure you're you're doing business with like kind and like quality, right? And so so I think that's the biggest key. And I think uh, again, your participants pointed out some really good points about what to look for in groups and how to differentiate between all the different types of groups, whether they're clusters, aggregators, or, or uh, networks. Yep, yep. So reiterating the point, making sure you know up front what you want, what you want to sell, and then asking the right questions when the time comes to make sure that it's a fit as it relates to that. Uh, Absolutely. Good points, Chris. Thank you. Um, so just can open it up for the last couple of questions. I know, again, we're a couple minutes over here. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to fire them away. And I know Jimmy just put in the chat a lot of the questions that he would ask networks before. Uh, I think that was direct, Jimmy. Let me go ahead and put this. And if there's anybody on this webinar who has, like, we've threw out a lot of verbiage. So if there's verbiage that you don't even understand, that's where I was when I started. So feel free to reach out to me um, because I, I have a passion for helping agents not experience what I experienced and just get you to um, a, a good starting point as an independent agent. So aggregator, I didn't know what aggregator was when I went over to be independent. Um, I didn't know what commission split to even look for. I didn't know what, if you go to YouTube, you're gonna get like, like so many different answers. So um, if there's anybody who just doesn't even know the verbiage here, feel free to reach out to me. 100%. Um, Jimmy, any final thoughts as well? Um, honestly, that, that grass is greener. Um, saying that my buddy always has like that's such a is a huge thing to me because like I feel like there are a lot of agents that are like oh if I just had more options then I'd be killing it right now you know and that might be true um but also all of the problems that you have with one carrier like now all of a sudden you've got all those same problems but now with like 20 carriers you know yeah, that's, that's true and so uh, it's a lot more work. I, even me analytically, and I feel like I'm a relatively smart guy and I can figure out systems and, and stuff like that. I mean, I had trouble. There was a learning curve for the first three to six months for me to figure out how to efficiently do just a, a simple auto home quote is driving me nuts. Um, and so there's a lot to undertake. Um, so don't underestimate that, but just, do some self-reflection and be like, do what is true to you, you know, to your values, figure out what you value most, and then, you know, align yourself with that. Great, great. Um, so thank you, Camille. Thank you, Jimmy. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to do this and educate. Uh, obviously, it, with anything you do, it's it's better to hear from somebody who's done it. 
Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of people here that uh, found value in what you provided. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty that'll come through and, and search for this.